statistics tonight uh, to choose those which we generally believe uh, are accepted by both sides in this abortion debate. Forty-five percent of all women, our statistics tell us, will have had one abortion by the time she is 45 years old. Tonight in our audience, uh, there are people who've had abortions, there are people who prefer not to talk about it, there are people who suffered great pain from it, and people who somehow feel they have been liberated by it. Joining us here on the panel is also Olivia Gans, who's the director of American Victims of Abortion. That's correct. Peter. What does that mean? I think it's interesting that Faye said that the rights of the child somehow are less valuable than the rights of the mother. And for me, as the mother of a child that died needlessly in 1981 because of the abortion I chose to have, the question is not whether the mother's rights supersede her child's. Our rights are equal, just as my rights as a woman are equal to yours as a man. Take me back to the time when you had the abortion. You were how old? I was 22. I was the typical age and age uh, lifestyle that the majority of abortions are performed on. I was a young college student. I was unemployed. I was unmarried. All of which are the basic statistics Why of the average woman. Why did you have an woman. abortion? Mostly because of my boyfriend's pressuring. He was extremely concerned about his position. I was concerned also. We were both pursuing our careers, our education, etc. The circumstances were bad. Where did you have I had it for social reasons. You had it for social reasons. That's exactly what it boils down to. Where did you have it? In a public clinic? In a private clinic? I had it at a private doctor's office. Did you have any counseling beforehand? I had spoken to two other abortionists and a Planned Parenthood abortion counselor before finding the abortionist that they recommended. And that is how I came to that man's office. And they it is my conclusion mm -hmm. that the lack of information women receive in these facilities is one of the crimes of the current status of abortion in America. 4,000 times a day, women in this country choose abortion, making it the most common surgical procedure American women have. Okay. So we have 45% of women up to the age of 45 are going to have abortion. That leaves 55% who haven't had any experience with what you've had. Yes, and I think the other important point that we must make and can't make most stressfully this evening is how much women need other options, other alternatives. The pro-life movement sponsors over 3,000 helping centers around the country, including the one that Mary Cunningham Agee... Well, we'll come to Mary Cunningham Agee in just a second. Faye Waddleton, you're the, as we said earlier, the president of the largest family planning organization in the United States. You counsel women on abortion? We do. We provide uh, counseling to women on all of the options available to them when they face an unwanted pregnancy. Would you indulge me, both of you, and counsel Ms. Gams? Um, I would ask Ms. Gans um, um, about her reason for being in the clinic today. Why are you here today? And maybe we can talk a little bit about what brings you here. That is the kind of thing I was asked. Now, proceed from there. I, I told you that I was unmarried. I told you that I was unwed. I told you that my boyfriend was the main reason I was having this abortion, that he felt I needed to have the abortion, that it was his concern about our circumstance. Well, I think that... that you probably should consider what your interests are and what your desires are here and maybe we could look at the options available to you in making your decision because this is really your decision it should not be your boyfriend's decision and now at this point Peter I will tell you that that is not the response I received from the particular person who counseled me I was told that uh, it was my decision but under the circumstances it did seem that this might be the most reasonable well, course I, of action I think for my boyfriend out, and I. I think that what this points out is that uh, Ms. Gans obviously did not have a, um, or make a decision that was satisfactory to us. We all make decisions that we regret later in life and that should not result in our working to punish other women to conform to uh, the mistakes but, but, that we made. Just but, stay with Ms. Gans for a second. I mean she clearly my is pain by this for a second. I yes, think that clearly she what, is what pain. What options have you told her she's well, we've Well we haven't gotten to those options well, because what her. I would say is that look, look at the options available to you uh, if you were facing a pregnancy and you did not want the pregnancy. Uh, the option, of course, is to continue the pregnancy if you desire, and we can certainly help you with prenatal care and refer you to the very best facility. Uh, you may choose to keep the baby after birth. That is a whole set of issues that you want to consider. Uh, you may choose to give up the baby for adoption after birth, and that's another option available to you. Or you may choose to terminate the pregnancy. That is a legal option. Ms. Gans, why These are the options. analysis did you finally... Because decide? I did not receive that kind of conversation from the individual who counseled me at Planned Parenthood. Well, what would you have done if you had received if it? If I had received it, I were the one making the, the, the decision. decision. Ms. Michaelman, just hang on a second. If, if, I had been, if I had been adequately counseled in such a sense that I was told what agencies to call if I was interested in other information about carrying my pregnancy to term, uh, what resources were available for my state or my county to carry my child to term as a single parent and other issues like that I might have felt more secure instead the particular Planned Parenthood Council I went to and this is where Miss Waddleton has to be answerable as the president of this organization is I was told have you made the decision already therefore 
Have you been? I told Stop them. Stop for a second. I, I told apologize. them. Stop Hang for just on. a second. Sorry. Stop for just a second. We'll be right back, and we'll try to get you some further counseling. Okay, well, right that's great. <laughs> <laughs> I believe I've received better counseling since then. In 1988, there were 1.6 million abortions performed in the United States. Recently, DuPont announced that its energy unit would pioneer the use of new double-hulled oil tankers in order to safeguard the environment. The response has been overwhelmingly positive. I told Tommy Lasorda that, I said, hey, just tell Lasorda you'll bring him linguine with clam sauce every night, <laughs> white or red sauce, and you're in, pal. No cut deal through 2000, <laughs> right? That is it. We've got to go. By comparing the price of... Raw material comes in. Three people control... Um, and share with us. It's going to be a, a, a magnificent center, and uh, we need your help. We're in the final... Central heat. Face. Something you do for then part by super watching C SPAN. And the six, just two dollars. Through the middle for the water sweat to the Provided by the gripe. And San Ramon. And true confessions, thou one. The signs, symptoms. This is a watershed, a fork in the road. If, if the Tribune Company can break the unions at the biggest newspaper and the biggest. We keep looking over there. And, uh, I photographed her, and that was the last time. And I only used about a half a roll of film because it was all there. There was no point in going on. The car company? i just come from the hospital. That was the last time I photographed her, but there was a time when she called after that. I was living in London at the time, and I'd just gone back to New York, and I was at home in the country. And she called my sports sedan. She was going to sing happy birthday to the president. John Kennedy was then president. And I had just come in. I was exhausted. And I knew what it would be. It would be me dancing attendance and coming in first. And she would come in with lots of other people. And I was tired. And I thought there was nothing I could add to everything I'd done. And I said, Marilyn, I think not. And I've always regretted it, because I think it might have been nice to have seen her that once, when she sang in that breathy voice. And mystery. That was it. Guard to make ends meet. Now they're paying the financial and emotional toll of leaving their families behind. 2020, Friday. Crisis in the Gulf, day 90. Tomorrow, comments from Secretary of State James Baker. Also, Fiddler on the Roof turns 25. And Terry Garr here on Good Morning America tomorrow. Abortion, the new civil war. Once again, Peter Jennings. We're in the process of getting Olivia Gans counseling on the question of whether or not she should have an abortion. Um, Mary cunningham Agee, formerly a member of the uh, corporate world, familiar to many Americans in that respect, but you now run something called the Nurturing Network. Tell us briefly what it is. Nurturing Network is in all 50 states. It was founded six years ago to provide all of the support a pregnant woman, working woman and college woman in particular, needs in order to make the choice for birth for her child. So Ms. Gans was at college, perhaps you'll counsel her. If Olivia came to our offices, we would let her know that if she chose to give birth to her child, we would be prepared to provide her with a doctor who would take care of the entire expenses, either the doctor or we would, a counselor that she could meet with as frequently as she needed to during and immediately after her pregnancy, a nurturing home with whom she could live if her own home was no longer available, with her parents or her boyfriend. We would give her, most importantly, if she's in college, an opportunity to transfer to a different college 
so that peer pressure would not be an issue. If she's a working woman, we'd give her a comparable job. In a different environment, not funny, but very much an issue for women who are faced with this problem. We would give her a comparable job in another location where she could take a leave of absence from her current employer if this is necessary and continue her career path. Dr. Hutchin, in listening to this, in listening to this, in listening to this, I am struck by, again, the number of abortions you have performed and wonder whether or not if there were less pressure on people to have abortions and more alternatives available, would there be fewer, do you think? Well, it's a very, very complex issue. There are many, many valid reasons that, oh, that a woman has to resort to abortion. It's, n it's seldom just one reason. It's usually three or four. And uh, it's, uh, I think oh, this is all very well. Uh, the, the nurturing program's wonderful, but it just doesn't begin to cover the problem. There are a million and a half done, and, and there is, it, it would be impossible for, for a, a nurturing network to take care of those million and a half women. Could I respond? Well, I think there is a lot more that we can do, uh, including programs like this, that w offer supports um, to women, um, financial support to ensure that women who want to have children have the supports uh, necessary medical care available to women so that we don't have infants die. There's a lot more we can do both as a government, as a, as a, uh, as a government, as private people. But that doesn't, I mean, that's all necessary. And in fact, as I started the program discussing the fact that we're really working on the wrong problem here. It's not abortion, it's the unintended pregnancy problem that we should have, that we should address as a policy. But all of the supports in the world are important. But when a woman faces a crisis pregnancy, she needs to know about what's available to her, all of her options, all of the supports, but the final decision, the final moral, religious, ethical, philosophical decision must remain with her. And that these supports can help alleviate the stress of a decision and make sure that she can make the best decision for her, but that it can't becomes, take away her decision. That's critical. What Kate's talking about is absolutely vital, and that's the key problem in the abortion business today. The abortion business, including Kate's organization, Why do you call the abortion business? Because it is a business. I paid $350 in cash before my abortion could be performed, as have all of the hundreds of thousands of women that belong to the various post-abortion peer support groups around the country. Now, the most important thing that Kate said was the need for women to have information. When my baby was killed in 1981, because of the choice I made, <clears throat> I was not told about the development of my child and that at 12 weeks of pregnancy, my baby already had its tiny little hands and feet, its heart was beating, my baby had a perfectly unique set of fingerprints, its genetic makeup, her body, her personality was totally in place at 12 weeks when I had my abortion. Well, now, Kate's organization and Faye's organization have consistently fought informed consent legislation that would make sure that a woman like myself was given as information a like that. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, I think it would be very, very wise for Ms. Gans to, to get herself better informed about the counseling that does go on. Planned Parenthood has a long history and tradition of supporting informed consent. We are not interested, however, in terrorizing women that's not uh, true. With, with pictures of, of bloody fetuses. And that's really the point. For nine years, for nine years I have directed... It's, it's really for, to unfortunate that your... That your that for nine years. For nine years. For nine years. And you one, had, you one had last comment. You had your shot. For nine years, I have worked with women who claim yeah. that Planned Parenthood and other pro-abortion agencies mm. did not provide them information. For nine years in the United States and abroad, where Planned Parenthood and its affiliates have sponsored pro-abortion activities, the women I've worked with have not received this information. Now, Ms. Gans, now, that's now, critical. Now have you had your shot? Yes, okay. thank you. Ms. Waddleton, go on. Uh, Ms. Gans, I think that once again, I would urge you to get better informed before you make such, such fallacious charges. But the point is, is that yes, women should be informed and they should be given all of the information that helps them to make an informed decision. That's really why we have fought the Bush administration's proposal to withhold information. And while we think these kind of discussions are important, because we do believe that people should be informed, your experience should not be
interpreted on everyone else. I have a different personal experience in my life, and I plead for the right to make my choice, just as I respect your right to make your choice. That's the compromise Then position. I hope that Planned Parenthood Ms. Ms. and, Bird, and national, national is, right to Linda life... Bird Frankie is just <laughs> dying to get in here. Ms. Frankie, let me reintroduce you, <laughs> or at least try to reintroduce you. Um, Ms. Frankie is a, is, a, is a political candidate, a candidate for political office on the question of choice. We'll come to that when we talk about politics. You're also a supporter of something called East End Choice at the eastern end of New York State and Long Island. You're Correct. dying to say something, but well... <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm, I want to speak not as a politician and not as the founder of East End Choice, but as the author of The Ambivalence of Abortion, which I wrote uh, in 1976. And really, uh, Ms. Gans, it, it, it does appear that you fit a, a, a certain sort of personality um, when you had your abortion, mm -hmm. you blame it on somebody else. It wasn't your choice, it was your boyfriend's fault. Let's start with that. The second issue is that you now are in a position to have had, to have completed that pregnancy. Your situation has changed, you're older, perhaps you're more settled, you're making money, what have you. And very often, women project backwards when they are able, indeed, to have a, a wanted pregnancy and chastise themselves for an unwanted pregnancy which they had to end because their circumstances couldn't support it. Peter, there's a tremendous difference here that is not being brought out here. Mm -hmm. If we take, let me use numbers a little bit loosely, but if we take a hundred women who walk into... <laughs> you set yourself up for that one. That's fine. <laughs> If we take 100 women that walk into a Planned Parenthood abortion facility, about 98 are going to get abortions. If we take those same 100 women who mistakenly go into a problem pregnancy center thinking that it is an abortion clinic, 80% will change their mind. Help me here. Now, problem that's not a loose figure. Help me some. Problem pregnancy center. Something a like problem American pregnancy magic. center is a woman helping center that doesn't advertise that it's pro-life. It merely says... Pregnant and troubled, free pregnancy tests while you wait. Women go into those places in droves. They think they're going to get an abortion. How much is it? And they're told, they're not told lies. They've long since learned not to do that. They're told, well, we want to do a pregnancy <laughs> test. If you wish, you can see a slide set, a little video here, while we do your right. pregnancy test. All that slide set does is describe fetal development which they don't get from Planned Parenthood, yeah. give the options, which they didn't get from Planned Parenthood, talk about what, um, what Mary Cunningham AG just said, we'll get a home for you and so forth, show legitimate scientific pictures of the development of the unborn baby, let them hear the heartbeat, which is there already at six weeks that you can listen to, given information, given alternatives, four out of five change their minds. Stop and I'm here to say... Fine. Stop for just a second. Four out of five change their minds. Do they not get all this information at Planned Parenthood? Well, Absolutely it's, it's, not. Ms. Um, Dr. Wilkie, I doubt that you have been in a counseling session at Planned Parenthood recently, so I, I hear think it may, be, it may be reasonable for you to, to withhold your, your judgment about that, but I, I think it's really excellent that Dr. Wilkie has described the nature of these so-called problem pregnancy pr uh, clinics that women go into thinking that they're going to be helped to look at all of the options available to them, and the only thing that they are told is why they should not have an abortion, rather than looking at what may be available to them and helping them to make that choice. And many women feel offended, uh, they feel invaded, and they often leave the centers quite frightened. And about I don't think 20 that this is anyway. Their mind and leave. But the, That's but the right. idea is that we're not here to change women's minds, Dr. Wilkie. I think we have the facility, if given rational and objective information to make those choices for ourselves. And that's what we please Actually, for. actually, the, the, the problem... Hang on, Ms. Okay. The, the problem Ms. is Ms. that Ms. the information Ms. is... Ms. You women put me walk in a into, very bad position of, of, of beating up on a woman. Oh, I don't... I wouldn't do. want to do But, but women do walk into Planned Parenthood Ms. thinking Ms. that they're Ms. going to get all the options, and they don't get all the options in Planned Parenthood either. That's the problem. And Peter, why is it that Planned Parenthood is vigorously fighting a bill in my state of Ohio that would require informed consent for a woman? They are the chief opponent. That's right. 
the name of the bill is a woman's right to know bill. It isn't necessarily going to stop any abortion. Mr. It's a Jennings, I don't right think I don't think that this I don't think that this, Parenthood Parenthood this program I don't think that this program was designed as a referendum on Planned Parenthood. I think that this was a program that was a serious effort to look at the abortion issue and why there are different points of view. Now, we can certainly go into Planned Parenthood at length, but I think the point is, is that to, to really get at why we are concerned about this issue is that people do have a wide divergence in a pluralistic society of opinions. We seek moral guidance from our religious teachers, not from politicians or people who want to meddle in our lives. And and that's really what the essence of this system of democracy and government and our pluralistic society is about. And I, I, we only plead that we be permitted the muddled middle, the people who are confused, the people who are conflicted, and Americans are conflicted about this issue, be left to our own devices to work these things out for ourselves in our own lives. I think Problem with that, point. though, we come back. <laughs> We'll come, it is, however, very much in the political arena, as Dr. Wilkie alluded. Let's come back in a moment and talk about abortion and politics. Of the 1.5 million babies born each year following unwanted pregnancy, only 2% are put up for adoption. Years ago, when this was my piano, your... So she wouldn't believe you. It was... And... One of the... Hearings in Hokkaido. Uh, it's very hard. Meanwhile, former Prime Minister Yasuhiro Nakasone had talks with incumbent Prime Minister Toshiki Kaifu today, prior to Nakasone's visit to Iraq beginning Saturday. Nakasone said that if his upcoming meeting with Iraqi President Saddam Hussein does not produce a peaceful solution to the Gulf crisis, he is willing to visit Iraq repeatedly and continue his efforts. Kaifu promised he will support Nakasone wholeheartedly. In the meantime, an Iraqi foreign ministry spokesman has announced Iraq will allow hostages' families to visit Iraq to meet the hostages for Christmas and New Year. However, the Iraqi National News Agency reported that these allowances have been planned for hostages from Western nations, and it is not yet clear if Japanese hostages are included. The Imperial Guard established a guard and security headquarters today. With the upcoming Imperial enthronement on November 12th, the guards started thorough checks, including traffic in and out of the Imperial Palace. The Guard and Security Headquarters will mobilize 960 Imperial Guards for security control. Guard posts have been established at the six main gates of the Imperial Palace and the Akasaka Palace, including the Inui and Kikyo gates. These posts are equipped with terminals connecting directly with the computer in the headquarters. This will enable them to your body's potential. the identity of people and vehicles passing into and out of the Imperial Palace and other places. Tokyo police divers have started checking the moat and bridges near the Imperial Palace for explosives. Around Nijubashi Bridge, they dove into the moat and checked the piers of the corner of your home. There were many tourists near Nijubashi Bridge today. They seemed surprised at the seriousness of the guard. The police will increase the number of policemen on duty starting next Wednesday. They will guard against terrorism and guerrilla activity by extremists. Nelson Mandela, Deputy Side Regulation Initiative. 135 doubles testing of food, seeks an end to aerial med fly spraying, trains farm workers on safe pesticide use, and uses science to find alternatives to pesticides. 135, it's good science and just the right medicine for healthful food. Well, as most people across the country know, next Tuesday's election day, and of course abortion features in a great many of the elections. By our estimate, about half of the governor's races, a third of the races in the Senate, two dozen congressional races, and hundreds of races at the state legislature level. We want to try now to figure out just how big an impact abortion is having in this year's campaign. And you've already heard a little bit here from Linda Frankie, Linda Bird Frankie, who is running for state assembly in New York. Ms. Frankie, I know you now as an author because you were speaking tonight. I also know as your mother, and I know you as a friend, uh, and now we know you as a politician. You're running on choice. You decided to run purely on the choice issue. Is that correct? No, that's incorrect. 
In um, March of 1990, you said that you were running on the choice issue and choice would be the decisive one in this election. I was catapulted into the political arena because of the Webster decision, which returned control of certain abortion rights to the states. Um, <clears throat> that was my impetus for entering the political arena. Since then, of course, many other issues have come into the race, but that's why I entered. What surprises some of us a little bit in New York State is that you're running on the question of abortion in a state where it's easier to get an abortion than a great many other places in the country, where it doesn't appear to be particularly threatened. Did it seem a good opportunity for you to get into politics using the issue? I had no uh, intention of getting into politics as a, as a career. I am deeply committed to a woman's right to choose. I have been for years. I started marching in, in the late 60s in New York State when the issue was uh, whether abortion would be legal and safe then. Um, I wrote a book, as I said earlier, about abortion in 1976. Uh, I watched with horror when the Hyde Amendment got passed, uh, restricting abortion rights to poor women. Then the Human Life Amendment came along. Once more, I was reactivated. When the Webster decision came down uh, in 1989, I said, okay, that's it. This time, I'm tossing my hat in the political ring, and I'm going to run. Okay. I, it is our misfortune, I believe, that your opponent, who we invited to come here this evening, is not here. We've called his home. Um, he's supposed to be on his way here, so there doesn't appear to be any nefarious reason for why he's not here. But with the help of Mr. Worthlin, uh, who uh, advises Republicans in the main, can we try to figure out how we should go about this debate with Miss Frankie on the campaign trail? John Bann believes in parental notification. If he were sitting here, I think he would say, my 13-year-old daughter needs permission to get her ears pierced. The least that should happen is the parents should be notified. What's wrong with that, Miss Frankie? Well, if you're really concerned about the health of your child, um, you would not support parental consent. I think this is really a very, very troublesome issue and one that disturbs me a great deal. I have two daughters of my own, as you know, and one would really like to think that one's daughter could come, with them, uh, come to them in, in such a crisis as an unwanted pregnancy. And a great many do, uh, a large percentage, especially the younger ones, 13, 14, 15 come to a parent. But there are those who cannot come to a parent for whatever reason. Now, we have, there's a lot of talk about dysfunctional families, you know, that the, perhaps there's incest, perhaps there's drug addiction, perhaps there's, you know. But we also have to consider the family, as we have in Indianapolis, uh, the case of a young girl, 17 years old, who loved her parents too much to tell them that indeed... Do you take all that time to explain all that on the campaign trail? Um, I, I need as much time as I can to okay. explain well, this, because this is a very not, troublesome issue, that parental consent. We're not going to give consent. you too much time on the campaign trail, I assume, to go into it at great depth. Now, help me, Mr. Worthen, because I've never voted against abortion funds, I believe, in the state. How do I deal with this, Frankie? Well, I think there are two or three things, uh, Peter, that you should be advised about. First, uh, I am, of course, I am, of course, Mr. Behan. All right. Mr. Behan, uh, the first thing I'd tell you is that of all of the issues that Americans are considering, this issue attracts more single-issue voters than anything else. About 9% of Americans say they vote solely on the issue who are pro-choice and 9% who vote solely on the basis of pro-life. Further, I would indicate, however, as a Republican, you do have an advantage because those people who are pro-life tend to cross parties more easily, that is, Democrats who are pro-life tend to vote more easily for a Republican than the other way around. So what's the best position for me to have? Well, the first thing I'd tell you is, in this case, as we, uh, it's the first order in terms of the counsel we give to candidates. Be true to yourself. This is an issue that you've got to have what you say in public align perfectly with what you believe privately. Candidates who have been hurt most on this issue are candidates who attempted to trim and move. Secondly, I'd tell you that... Uh, well, can don't I just tell you a little bit more about what I okay, am, if please. I am, Mr. to be and I'm anti-abortion, yes, personally, but I have, but Roe v. Wade is the law of the land, and I'm not going to do anything to interfere with the law of the land, but I'm personally opposed to abortion, and my candidate is basically in favor of it. That's right. And many candidates tempt to opt out this way. And I think particularly in this environment where there's a lot of anti-incumbency feeling, 
you're on fairly dangerous ground, oh, really Mr. Vian, because people want politicians to walk the talk. They don't, they are not letting candidates off the hook by saying, I may personally be a, uh, against abortion, but uh, I will accept whatever uh, the district or the area uh, votes on the issue. What if a district is, for example, pro-choice? Should I just be pro-choice automatically? Absolutely not. <coughs> That's the worst thing you could do. Uh, there, there is a congruence. It comes out a thousand different ways. If you are not saying what you believe, you're more vulnerable than even taking an unpopular well, position. Well, the truth of the matter is in my race with Miss Frankie, she's all completely pro-choice, and it isn't even a big issue. It's taxes and, and the war in the Gulf, which is much more important. Now, do I have her? Not necessarily. Uh, no. It depends upon a lot of other things. Uh, and you've just arrived at your position, if I can point that out to you, Mr. Bean. Um, <laughs> when we started this campaign, uh, you were not at all uh, supportive of the law of the land. You were saying that you were against abortion, uh, and you didn't know how you would vote if it came before you in the New York State Assembly. I think we're replaying your campaign, which is slightly unfair to Mr. Bean, as I do not know his whole history here. No, 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 but it just comes okay. right up to now, the position being that he would... Uh, <laughs> But you think I'm on bad ground if I'm personally opposed to it, but I'm prepared to support the law of the land, which is Roe v. Wade. That's becoming more and more untenable for politicians to opt out in that particular what fashion. What if I, should I change my mind? From, what happens if I change my mind to the voter? You are in uh, deep trouble. Uh, oh, I'm also in good company. I'm so glad you were going to say that. <laughs> we, we have another of those infamous film clips here to show you just what kind of the political circumstance is this year. There are a number of people including President Bush, who've changed their mind as they go along. Let's take a look at this. In 1980, George Bush made an unsuccessful bid for the Republican presidential nomination. On abortion, he was in favor of a woman's right to choose. Do you favor or oppose a constitutional amendment against abortion? I oppose such an amendment. Uh, I don't favor a federal amendment to overthrow the Supreme Court decision. By 1984, when he was running for re-election as Ronald Reagan's vice president, Bush had changed his position. The president and I do favor a human rights amendment. But recently, the trend has been for politicians to change position the other way, from anti-abortion to pro-choice. A number of this year's candidates are banking on their newfound pro-choice positions to turn their campaigns around. New Hampshire Democrat John Durkin voted the right to lifeline during his entire 1975 to 1980 Senate term. In 1980, he wrote a letter to the state anti-abortion group, which said the following. Let there be no doubt that I remain committed to those values which earn me the Defender of Life Award from the New Hampshire Pro-Life Council. These days, in his Senate campaign against Bob Smith, Durkin is no less adamant in his views. I'll fight to protect the right of choice for my two daughters. Bob Smith, keep your hands off the rights of my daughters and the women of New Hampshire. John Durkin is pro-choice. David Emery, Republican of Maine, is running to reclaim the congressional seat he gave up in 1982 to run for the Senate. He was anti-abortion then, and he lost. Today, Emory has a new position. And that's why I've taken a pro-choice position, because it's what I believe is best for a woman who's faced with a very difficult choice to make. When Democrat Anthony Celebrezzi was campaigning for Ohio State Attorney General four years ago, he sent his sincere thanks and gratitude to the Ohio Right to Life Society for its endorsement. This year, running for governor, he's on the opposite side. It should be a personal decision. The woman should consult anyone that she wants to consult, but that the decision should be her decision. The government should not intervene in the making of that decision. As governor of Kansas, Republican Mike Hayden was applauded by anti-abortion groups for signing a number of Family Life Day proclamations. Now, running for re-election, Hayden is in favor of a woman's right to choose. I believe that abortion is a personal and private decision. I believe that women should have the right to make that choice for themselves without interference by politicians. Pastor Welch, do you trust these people who change their minds? <laughs> Absolutely not at all. 
Uh, I say if, you know, what we say is if, if you are pro-life but, then it's time to butt out of pro-life because you don't belong in pro-life. Uh, pro-life are people who are out here attempting to do what it takes to save these babies' lives. And, you know, we keep dancing around this thing. We're going through this counseling session. We're going through this political thing. But the bottom line on all this is that we're talking about people dying, babies dying. And the, the sad thing about it all is this is not the group that's going to make the decision about all this. It's the people back home, people well, and, watching And you, sir, will have a chance to mobilize them next Tuesday. What if all those candidates had changed the other way? Would you then have trusted them? The trick to it all, it seems to me like, is that they need information, information from the news media. Uh, if this is a civil war, and I believe you're right, contrary to what others have said, then the media should do, and I would hope you would do it, you should do the same thing with this civil war that you did with Vietnam, uh, that you did with, uh, that you'll do with the Middle East, that you did with Ethiopia. You should bring the blood and guts of this thing into the living room of the home. But we you're took slightly, it then. But you're... We, we could take it then, Mr. Jennings, and we could take it now. But you see, the people out there, I, tonight, when I was coming over in the car, I was playing your role. I asked <laughs> the driver, I said, what do you think about abortion? He says, I think it's all right. Because, I said, why do you think it's all right? And he said, because the baby doesn't feel anything. And I said, no, the baby does. Pastor really. Welch, you're evading the issue. Forgive me for interrupting. You were in our primetime hour, sat there with a disengaged yes. lever from a ballot box in your I'm hand. I'm not evading. You, I may misunderstand. And you said, you yes. said, this is the bottom line. Absolutely. This is what counts. Right. Now, I just asked you okay, if you again. could mobilize all those people next Tuesday and they had changed the other way, would you then trust them and support them? I don't understand the if question. They trust, really if they'd gone from being pro-choice to pro-life, as we've decided the titles, would you then have supported them? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Because you know why? How the you only trust politicians I can tell you, one way I can tell you. Uh, I don't, only to the extent that they understand the facts. Like the guy in the taxi cab, that was my point. He had never come to grips with the fact that this is somebody dying and suffering. And a lot of politicians are that way. And I agree with Judge Bork. I think a lot of people on the choice side do not understand this is blood, guts, agony, and death, and there's a pile of body parts, arms, and legs out there. The news media, Mr. Jennings, let me finish this. The news, you, you all did a superb job on Vietnam. That was a war. I, I was there, I saw you, uh, I ate with you. Uh, you did a superb job on covering Ethiopia. You'll do a superb job on the Middle East. If this is a civil war, come, come down in the trenches with us. Get the, bring the blood and guts. Make this, show them in the living room what this is all about. And I'll guarantee you the American public, once they have that knowledge, they will stand up and say, we don't want this. Peter, Pastor, I think, Peter, <laughs> Peter, Peter, I think Pastor that... Pastor Welch was all, uh, just a Marine in Vietnam, and uh, let's no, no, go no, on... No, Army, 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 Army. <laughs> and, and let's go back to the trenches because, yeah. in fact, the trenches are next Tuesday right. in legislative races all over the country. Ms. Michael, you've seen them come your way in these switches. Do you trust them? I think it's wonderful to see politicians understand the difference between their personal view on abortion and um, public policy. And that's what we're seeing. And we're also seeing that politicians are understanding that pro-choice Americans who are in the majority, and I'll remind people what we mean by being pro-choice, we mean that a woman is free without government intervention to make a decision when she's faced with a crisis pregnancy. And politicians are understanding the power for the first time in a very long time of the pro-choice vote. And we're seeing politicians using the pro-choice issue mm -hmm. more than any time in American history. And I'd like to differ with Mr. Worthlin. I mean, he says it's more advantageous to be um, anti-choice. Well, I think Governor Wilder, Governor Florio, and many other candidates that you featured even on your special are uh, actually speak to a different, um, a different Does reality. Does that mean, Ms. 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 Michael, do you think they're more afraid of you than they are perhaps of... I, th I think what politicians are hearing from for the first time is a powerful voice of people who say government has no role in making these personal decisions. And the American public was shocked by the Webster decision into a new awareness 
that the court is rolling back its protections of our right to privacy, our right to choose, and that the only way now to secure that right is through the power of our vote. And they are holding politicians accountable in a way they've never held politicians accountable. And I have to say that the anti-choice movement for 17 years had been very effective in organizing their people to vote on the issue of, of abortion. We, we were very complacent. We, the pro-choice community, were fairly complacent in believing that the court would always be there. The court continued to reaffirm Roe versus Wade. But now they understand that the court has signaled its willingness to take away that right, to overturn that right, and now they must act on it through the power. Can I hold you up there for a second? Because speaking of powerful organizations, not to mention <coughs> patients, uh, uh -huh. Father, Father Richard McBride is the chairman of the theology department at Notre Dame University. Thank you for being so patient, Father. Mr. Um, Bean has spoken more than I have so far this evening. <laughs> you were saying uh -huh. that line, I know. Um, <laughs> the, uh, it, it's a propitious moment in some respects because the Catholic Church has been very involved in this election campaign, the National Conference of Catholic Bishops began the campaign year by trying to get Catholic candidates who actually, were in favor of choice? Actually, Peter, Peter, it hasn't been involved in this election. I think abortion, I think contrary to the premise of the, of the special at 10 o'clock, I think abortion has been a relatively minor issue in, these, in, the, in this election. Uh, uh, taxes, the deficit, uh, congressional leadership, presidential leadership, the Persian Gulf, in fact, I'm dismayed as a, as a Catholic who, who does believe uh, that uh, abortion is immoral, and yet I'm also, I also believe that we have to respect the, the, the very consensus, uh, the lack of a consensus in our society, and therefore our laws have to re re reflect and respect that. But I'm, I'm dismayed that it, has, it, it is no longer uh, an issue that's taken seriously. Uh, so, but as a matter of fact, the American bishops have been relatively silent this year. I think. I think uh, they found that some of their activities in the public forum were counterproductive. I think earlier this year, for example, mention of excommunication, uh, mention of withdrawal of the right to communion, uh, actually was a benefit uh, to the, uh, to the, to the uh, politician. Uh, Mario Cuomo, uh, whom I respect for many, many reasons, Governor, uh, of, New York. Uh, Governor of New York, is, is running this year without even the slightest. Uh, he is, he's always been really the, probably the most um, uh, despised politician in the Catholic pro-life movement. He's got to walk away. I mean, the, the pro-life candidate in New York isn't even going to get 2%. It is sometimes said that Governor Cuomo is the only person who can run on that and get away with it. Well, no, others are running. Uh, others have done the same thing. I mean, look at the governorships in Massachusetts, in Texas, and California. They are, they're, they're high stakes. The high stakes are not over abortion. The high stakes are over who's going to control the state legislatures to control the, the, re, the reapportionment in those states so that I think the, 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 extra Michael, do you agree the extraordinary this, that thing this, uh, is that abortion is not a dominant issue in this Peter, campaign. Let me do you go. agree with this, Ms. Michael, Mann, that this is not an issue in this campaign? I didn't say extent? it's not an issue, I it's said not a dominant issue. to the extent issue. that we've talked about it? Uh, I, I think it is a very important issue in races all across this country. It is not, however, the only issue on the minds of voters, but it is absolutely one of the two or three most important issues when voters go to the polls and go into those voting booths, especially in races where the candidates are so starkly different, in Iowa, in uh, Florida. In Florida, the race may very well be decided, the governor's race, may very well be decided on this issue. And I, I, I want to speak to Pastor Mr. Wilson Welch, again. Will but let me, uh, 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 can these I, can two I say... talked here for a minute, these two politicians talk. Would you let two preachers talk just a sure. second? Sure. <laughs> go ahead, preachers. Uh, I, I'm just interested, uh, uh, Reverend McBride, uh, Help me on this. I cannot for the life of me see how a person can be a Christian and support pro-choice and anti-abortion position and at the same time say they have a walk consistent with the Lord. Because I cannot for the life of me imagine God in a zillion years, God standing out there beside a pro-choice abortion advocate with a pile of baby body parts and saying, well done, good and faithful servant, God bless you. I cannot see that. Well, the, the fact of the matter is that many, many Christians disagree on this. Well, of course. But let, me, let me ask you a question that might also go to Dr. Wilkie. If you identify pro-choice with pro-abortion right. and pro-abortion with pro-murder, that means any candidate who is pro-choice or who supports pro-choice candidates ought to be opposed by you, correct? 
I'm Have not you... sure that follows. Well, why not? If pro-choice is pro-abortion, and pro-abortion is pro-murder, then a pro-choice candidate is pro-murder, according to that logic. Is that true? It doesn't no. matter how it comes out. No. Murder is murder. Okay. Murder is murder, Fine. and God is not going to be for that. I'm asking... And God's not going to bless I... us killing these kids off. We... And I one do... day, we will stand before God Almighty and let answer for it. Let him I do a weekly that. column in the Catholic Press, and I have a column coming out right after the election. I'm going to invite my readers, my Catholic, mostly Catholic readers, to send me any evidence in the press, any clippings of any prominent pro-life person, whether a bishop or a lay Catholic, who has publicly criticized President George Bush or Congressman Henry Hyde for supporting pro-choice candidates all over. Henry Hyde in Illinois supporting Jim Edgar for governor. He supported Jim Edgar in the Republican primary over a strong pro-life candidate. He's supporting Lynn Martin for the U.S. Senate. George Bush is going literally from Hawaii to I think Rhode you're Island. dodging no, the question. He's going I from think Hawaii. You're the question. I'm saying that, that the position you're holding is not consistent. That if, you, if we really are serious, that we're dealing here with pro-choice equals pro-abortion equals pro-murder, then we should be after every politician, not just liberal Democrats. We should hold George Bush's feet to the fire. You're talking fire. politicians. I'm talking Jesus. I'm talking consistency. <laughs> talk to I, me about that a little bit. I, talk, I, I heard politics talking, here and I heard I'm politics here. Let's me and you talk about this while he's speaking. And I'm a person, as, as a Catholic and as a, as a person of faith, I believe that abortion is immoral. I'm concerned about the ineptitude of the pro-life movement. I'm concerned about it because it's inconsistent. <laughs> It's politically inconsistent. It's politically partisan. You let George Bush off the hook. No, you, I'm concerned you let Henry about Hyde innocent the hook. babies dying. Uh, you're avoiding uh, my point. No, you're no, letting, that is the point. You're letting innocent George Bush off the hook. Innocent babies are dying. You're letting and Henry Hyde are off the hook. Out. I would. They would take Can, you Father, seriously you just a second? if let, you were let that. Let me please uh, get He's, into this. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, this was incorrect in saying that George Bush opposed an amendment to the Constitution. Right after he was nominated, I spent several hours with George Bush up at Kenny Bunkport, and we had a long talk. And when that day was over, in witness of a lot of other people, I asked him where he was. He was in favor of an amendment to the Constitution that would reverse Roe versus Wade. He was opposed to the use of anybody's tax money to kill unborn babies, except when the life of the mother was involved. The only thing he didn't approve was a federal human life amendment that would mandate protection across all of the states. And there is where he did move in four years. He moved from saying, I oppose Roe versus Wade, and I'll return that freedom back to the people of each state to determine how to regulate abortion. He moved to say, this is such a basic civil rights issue such a basic human rights issue that he then came our way and said, under the Constitution, we should protect these babies. Are we That's making George any, Bush. Are we making any ask, uh, here, ask uh, Father McBride a question? When uh, Henry Hyde, for example, went out and supported, you say, a pro-choice candidate, was, there, was his opponent pro-life? Yes, in the, in the Republican primary, yes. He was? Yes. Roger Rosenblatt, are we making any headway here? Um, making a little headway, I think. Uh, I was very interested in Father McBride saying that while he didn't change his moral stance about abortion, that if I understood you were right, that you appreciate an atmosphere in which a consensus is uncertain and that felt that the laws ought to reflect that uncertain consensus. Yes. That seems to me a beginning of a very sensible uh, way to Do you have any sense listening here this evening that, that either of these very powerful groups is prepared to make any room for the other? Well, not in the terms in which we've been talking now, and some of us have a greater proximity to God than others, so we, they engage in a conversation that others are uh, uh, not privy. But um, uh, that, that can be helped, by the way. I uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but perhaps after the show. Yeah, right. Yes. Uh, cer certainly after this commercial. Thank you very much. We'll be right back, sir. Possession. 460 abortion-related bills were introduced in state legislatures this year, three times as many as were introduced last year. My name's Jennifer. Collings reports. The whole truth 
Nothing Congressional happened. investigators say Samuel Pierce, who was Ronald Reagan's Secretary of Housing and Urban Development, misled Congress about his alleged involvement in HUD abuses and political favoritism. Uh, Mr. Pierce either was directly responsible for some of the misdeeds, or he displayed a degree of unawareness and lack of concern which borders on something mind-boggling. Investigators for a House subcommittee say HUD under Pierce was riddled with waste, mismanagement, and corruption that could cost the taxpayer $2 billion. The report said at best, Secretary Pierce misled the subcommittee about his involvement. At worst, Secretary Pierce knowingly lied about whether he personally ordered his assistant, Deborah Gordine, or anyone else to fund projects benefiting friends and influential figures. I don't remember telling how to fund any particular. I never told any of these people to fund anything. Pierce's lawyer refuted the conclusions. There is not one piece of credible evidence that this committee has produced thus far that could support the conclusion that Secretary Pierce, a former judge, former prosecutor, former cabinet official, intentionally, willfully, or purposefully lied or misled the committee. In a new revelation, the report says Pierce admitted to congressional investigators that then-Defense Secretary Casper Weinberger influenced HUD to grant a $3 million loan for an elderly housing project in Laguna Beach, California, a well-to-do area in contrast to the poor areas HUD was supposed to help. Weinberger's office admits he wrote a letter endorsing the project but denies any impropriety. Investigators also say HUD, under Pierce, funded a Pompano Beach, Florida housing project that benefited Pierce's former law firm in New York. Congressional investigators also said an official working in the office of then Vice President George Bush helped facilitate a half million dollar HUD project in Kansas City. As strong as it is, the con I don't know if you know this, but our ancient redwoods are in danger. There's only 5% left. We need to save them now. But when I looked into the propositions, there were two dealing with forests. Proposition 138 looked good until I found out that 138 was written by the timber industry. You've seen the clear-cutting. They've only got one thing in mind, and it isn't saving our redwoods. Proposition 130 is the one I'm voting for. It was written by environmentalists to save that last 5%. So please, vote yes on 130, no on 138. The ABC News Forum. Abortion. The new civil war continues. Once again, Peter Jennings. Well, I hope it's a testimony, from my own point of view it is, to the interesting uh, contribution of our panelists, but we've kind of neglected the audience. So let's go quickly to the audience. Tell me, please, sir, who you are. If you represent anybody, tell us that and ask you a question. Uh, my name is Bruce Weinfeld, and I'm involved with the Right to Life. I have a question for Ms. Watt I hope I pronounced your name. Waddington, I think? Waddleton. Waddleton, Waddle. thank you. Uh, since abortion is such a tough decision for someone to make, would you be in favor of a 24-hour waiting period for them to make a decision and let them think about it for 24 hours after they go to abortion clinic and why or why not? I don't believe that there should be arbitrary restrictions on a woman making the choice and seeking the service. I think that decision should be up to her. There's no reason to believe that she hasn't already thought about it for 24 hours. And these kinds of restrictions can simply place undue burdens on women, for instance, who live in rural areas, who must, must travel great distances if they are not close by uh, to abortion providers. But I think that your question raises a very important point that seems to have been lost very much here tonight, and that there's been no discussion about women. Right. We talk about fetuses and we talk about what a is lot being of these killed. People dying the point is, is that women, women died when abortion was illegal. Legality only means that women now do not die. And we plead for you the, to understand that this is an died. issue. We plead, we plead for your understanding. We plead for your understanding that this is we an issue her. about That's women. Cool. And our need to make these choices and to be able to carry out our decisions without my having to be forced to practice your God. I have a personal religious perspective, and it may not be yours. And in a society in which we do not have a state run religion and dictated religion, we must be free to make that decision. May I, may I respond? <laughs> I, we have Peter. a question right here. Yes, ma'am. My name is Angela Padilla, and I'm at Columbia Law School. I'm a Bible-believing Christian, and I also support a woman's right to choose legal abortion. My question is this. To whom? Given to the, to the pastor and also to the priest, please, and anyone else. 
My question is this, given the fact that our Lord Jesus did mm. not preach against abortion, given the fact that the apostles did not write about it, and given the fact that the only biblical reference to abortion or anything close to it is an exodus, which puts a higher value on the life of the mother than on the life of the fetus, how can you say that it is unchristian to be pro-choice, and how can you impose your Christianity and your theological perspective on all of those of us who are as devout Christians as you are? Pastor Will. I, thank you. What I said was this, is that I do not think it's possible to live a godly life and call yourself a Christian. And a lot of people, you know, are Christian but do not live a godly life. I said that is not possible if you are stacking up baby bodies. Now, to answer the question, the answer to the question is all you got to do is look at the life of Christ. You've made a good point. You don't see. Uh, Christ goes about doing good, loving people, caring for them. He didn't uh, want to get rid of the man by the pool who had been crippled for 38 years. He wasn't in favor of him being aborted. He wanted him, he was okay for him to be there. He still had a life worth living. And I tell you, many people in this world today would have been shut out 20 years ago, but they've got a life worth living today. Father McCrime. Well, you'll notice the pastor wasn't able to cite a text. Uh, there, is, there is no mention of abortion in the, in the New Testament. Which doesn't mean, however, I'm not now about to take your side, but there is no mention of it, but there is an awful lot about the value of life and about innocent Absolutely. people and about, the, about helpless people and about marginalized people. Now, to get from there those general values about human dignity, especially the dignity of the poor and the oppressed and the marginalized, to get from there to saying abortion is always immoral, one has to draw a series of arguments. It's not self-evident. And the thing that bothers me, even as a Catholic who believes, who's satisfied that abortion is immoral on its face, it, it is obviously not self-evident. We haven't obviously made the case. In the meantime, before the case has been made, we have to accept the actual pluralistic nature of our society, and the laws have to reflect the pluralistic nature of our society. It's not a matter, I would, I would uh, strongly impose any implication, it's not a matter of imposing religious belief. It's a matter of imposing a particular moral view. It took us an awful long time to get the moral view that slavery and then apartheid in America was, in, was wrong. It took an awful long time. It's going to take a long time, if it ever comes, that people will be persuaded on the abortion issue. Maybe we'll have another I... question in okay. just a moment. Thank you, Father. Oh. Everybody, I'm sorry, I have to go to commercial. Stay right here. We'll be right back with hypnosis. Our first guest is a uh, multi-talented and a uh, very funny man. We're always delighted to have him here with us on the big program. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome once again David Steinberg. Yeah, so what? Yeah, well, I'll... Off the cuff. Pain better than anyone in town. Not seen with the next. Depression already under class resorts.
John Jay College. I'd like to address a question to Dr. Hodgson. I would like your medical definition for the word person. You said you had you had performed many abortions. I believe it was 30,000. And I would like to you said that you didn't feel that you were killing. Now, exactly what do you what do you define in medical terms as a person? I don't believe there is a medical definition of the of person but it means, it implies um, uh, a, certainly a, 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 we don't deny that the fetus or the embryo is human, but personhood implies a great deal more. It it, a person can, uh, a, a fetus cannot be a person without a brain. Nothing can be a person that does not have a brain. And a fetus does not have a brain that is functional until at least 30 weeks. Oh, that's wrong. Uh, that's Peter, a that fantasy. That's simply incorrect. That's We're not talking about, in that case, you can kill unconscious people. What we're talking about here is life, yes, from the beginning, not dead. Human, yes, 46 human chromosomes, not a rabbit. Boy or girl, right from the start, complete and intact, yes. Judge Bork, the how word does the brain starts beating at the word brain starts beating at eight weeks. The brain is traceable. Judge Bork, Judge Bork, forgive me. <laughs> well, but <as> a <laughs> just tell us what the law says for the woman. Well, well, the the, the law, law is not a monolithic thing that has I one answer. That. But as, just just tell us Depends. when does the law decide that life begins now in terms of when one may have an abortion? Well, you mean the you mean the constitutional decision of Roe against Wade? Well, they said at the end of the at the end of the second trimester, uh, the state could prevent abortions for uh, having an interest in the life of the fetus. But after the Webster decision, that is all up in the air. Okay, thank you. That's all I want to know. The Next law of the land yes, still says that abortion yes, is legal through all nine months of pregnancy in all 50 yes, states, and that's a my critical is... point. Ms. Gans, you're depriving this poor young woman of a chance to ask you a question. Well, I've, I've finished my comment, Peter. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. My name is Eva Jerome, and I attend Columbia College, and I'd like to direct my question to the men on this panel. If you are having the babies, would there be this much...